Welcome to today's webinar. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is a program of the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. This webinar is brought to you thanks to the contributions of colleagues and partners in Wisconsin and across the nation, with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It is produced in collaboration with Healthy Places by Design, an organization that advances community-led action and proven strategies to ensure health and well-being for all. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejo since time immemorial. UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. This webinar will be recorded. All speakers' views are their own. Guest bios and slides from today's webinar are available on our resource page. We will share a link to the resource page when the webinar begins. Stay up to date on all things CHRNR. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you haven't already, sign up for our newsletter by scanning this QR code with your phone's camera. It's the best way to find out about upcoming webinars, our podcast, and our latest tools and resources. Your facilitators today include our host, Erica Burroughs Girardi, with support from CHRNR communication specialist, Colleen Wick, and the collaborative learning director from Healthy Places by Design, Joanne Lee. We invite you to continue the conversation immediately after the webinar in our discussion group. Joanne Lee will be our lead facilitator. And watch for a chat from Colleen for details on how to join the group after the webinar. Welcome to Engaging Communities and Budget Decisions to Build Power. My name is Eric burroughs Girardi, and I hope that you are just as excited about this topic as I am. I will tell you, I learned a lot while preparing for this webinar. CHRNR's webinars reflect the values we hold as part of the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. Values of collaboration, integrity, excellence, innovation, inclusion, and courage. These are values that we aim to model during the webinar, and we hope that you will too. With that, I'd like to introduce you to the team that will aid in your learning experience. And let's start with Joanne Lee with Healthy Places by Design. Hi, Joanne. Erica, and hello to everybody in our audience today. Thank you so much for joining and um, being eager to learn about today's topic. I'm here to tell you how you can engage with us during today's webinar, and there are two ways to engage. I will be in the Q&A box, so you can go ahead and open the Q&A box, have it ready, um, and anytime a question comes to your mind for one of our guest presenters, go ahead and type it in the Q&A box, and I will um, gather those and queue them up during the live Q&A portion of today's webinar. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Now, there's a second way to engage during today's webinar, and Colleen Wick will tell you about that. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Joanne. Um, as Joanne said, um, I will meet you in the chat. You could probably see how um, active it is right now. So we just want to use the chat to share knowledge, to respond to any questions we ask you during the presentation. Please join us in making the chat space welcoming by adhering to some guidelines. Make sure just to use the chat to share successes, lessons learned, relevant resources, links, See now people are sharing where they're from. Uh, please engage in a respectful dialogue. Um, our chat conversations tend to be very engaging, as you could see. So if they're too distracting, simply close the chat window in Zoom. Please know that the views expressed by speakers and participants are their own. They do not represent CHRNR or Healthy Places by Design. Once again, if you have any questions for the panelists, please make sure to use the Q&A box feature. And now I will pass it to our technologist, Erin. Hi, everyone. I'm Erin Schulten. And as Colleen said, I'm here to help with tech today. So if you have trouble seeing the slides or hearing the presentation, 
please send us a message in the Q&A box. Um, I've been at the practices. I know today's going to be a great webinar that you're going to enjoy. I'm going to turn it back over to our host now. Here you go, Erica. Thank you so much, Erin, and to the rest of the um, production team. I appreciate you. You know, communities are healthiest when everyone has opportunities and conditions necessary for better health. Everyone has a role to play and everyone should have a say in shaping society's rules and how they are applied. How well we keep everyone healthy depends on how well and how intentional we include everyone in setting priorities, making decisions, sharing resources, and determining what's acceptable. That's why we must consider what we call structural determinants of health. Structural determinants of health include society's written and unwritten rules, such as policies, laws, priorities, and even traditions. People in groups who hold more power shape society's rules. They determine how those rules will be applied based on their values and beliefs or how society should work. Ultimately, they determine who will reap the rewards and who bears the cost. Budgets are that or one type of structural determinant, one of those written and unwritten rules. They determine the distribution of resources, like whether government funds should go to housing or policing. Those decisions shape community conditions and ultimately health outcomes. So everyone should have a say in shaping those decisions. And collective action is essential to reshape norms, laws, policies, and practice to promote health and equity. And it's essential that those experiencing the most harm are leading these efforts. People in communities can build power to structure our society so that way everyone benefits, not just a few. Together, we can change the condition for everyone's health and well being. And that's why I'm excited about participatory budgeting. It's a strategy that can build community power. It is a process that gives community members a say in how public budgets are spent. This strategy holds many expected benefits when implemented well, including increased equitable distribution of public funds, increased civic participation, and government transparency. So here to share more about this strategy are Anita Dos Santos and Benji Biddle. Anita is the Advocacy Manager of Participatory Budgeting Project. Welcome, Anita. Hi, thank you so much. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. And welcome, Benji Biddle. He's the Business Development Manager at the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department. Welcome, Benji. Hi, Erica. Happy Black History Month, everybody. And thank you for recognizing that. So, um, and I'm excited to have you as well, Benji. Read more of our guest bios on our webinar resource page that Colleen's probably already chatted out, um, but you can read more about their exciting bios. Um, after today's webinar, we're gonna have a discussion group and we're gonna unpack what you're gonna hear today. So please plan to continue the discussion with us. During the video intro, you heard about our discussion groups that follow the webinar. They're facilitated by Joanne Lee and are always engaging, giving you the opportunity to share with and learn from others. Colleen will be chatting out information at the end of the webinar so you can link to that discussion group. Now, please join me in welcoming Anita back. Anita, um, why is participatory budgeting, and, and we're going to shorten that to PB. <laughs> it's, it's so long, yeah. and I'm going to trip over it eventually. Yes. But why is PB considered a democratic process? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say we can start off um, with just like a simple definition. So we all know what we're talking about when we say participatory budgeting or PB. So very simply, PB is a democratic process where community members directly decide how to spend part of a public budget. It's a meaningful way to make decisions because it's more than just a one day event. It's also not just a consultation. It's an annual cycle of meetings and voting that gets incorporated into the existing budget cycle. And so it's a way for real people to make real decisions about real money. I love the fact that people are actually involved in it, right? It's not just like 
it's real people being involved in discussions about yeah. money. Such, so, I mean, an important resource. So tell us a little bit how this, about how the strategy works. So what you can see on your screen right now is a cycle, and this is the participatory budgeting cycle. I'm going to go through each phase, starting with what's on the upper left-hand corner, design the process. And so after we identify a pot of funds, we start by uh, designing the process. We gather a group of volunteers from diverse backgrounds that are representative of the community to form a steering committee. They will make decisions about how the process will run. And so they'll decide things like who's eligible to vote, who can submit ideas, project eligibility criteria, and outreach strategies. Next, after we have designed our process, we'll open it up and invite the community to submit their ideas for projects. And idea collection can happen in person, um, at in-person events, it can happen online, or a combination of both strategies. After we've collected ideas, we convene a new group of community members who will be known as budget delegates. These budget delegates will take the ideas and develop them into concrete project proposals. They will research the needs in the community, the feasibility of the projects, the impact, the projected impact, and, um, and they'll do this to, to ensure that everything that makes it onto the ballot can be implemented impactfully. And so um, if the idea, for example, um, during idea collection was 24 seven bathrooms, um, they'll take this idea and they'll ask questions like, how much does it cost to build a public bathroom? How many do we actually need in this community? What neighborhoods or intersections um, would this be most impactful in, in placing, right? And so they'll ask those kind of questions and do that kind of research. Um, so they'll take those ideas that are concrete proposals now and create a ballot. And this ballot um, is what people will vote on during the voting phase. And so we give the opportunity, we give the opportunity to the community um, to vote on what they think is most interesting. And then finally, the winning projects are funded until the pot of money runs out. The last step um, that's not on this slide is evaluation. We um, evaluate the process to measure the success of um, whether we reach the goals that we had for the process to make adjustments for the next cycle. Thanks for sharing that. You know, earlier I talked about how this strategy, when done well, can build community power. Let's let's explore that a little bit more. How does the strategy hold the potential to build community power? Yeah, thanks for that question. And um, we think this is really important because in order for us to see the results that we love to see um, around PB with participant satisfaction with the process, seeing folks who participate in PB like continuing to be civically engaged um, and, and to see projects that in the end have a truly positive impact on the community, um, we have to do PB and do it well. And so that means making concerted efforts to invite folks who are normally left out of the traditional democratic processes um, and invite them to not only vote, but to design the process that they themselves and that the community will participate in. And the people who will be impacted by the decisions are the folks that we need in the room, right? And so... Um, one of the ways that we can do this, that we can center equity in the process, for example, is by... Um, you know, many processes um, allow folks who are traditionally not allowed to register to vote um, to vote in PD processes. So folks who are under 18, folks who are undocumented or formerly incarcerated, when we design for equity, there's no reason um, that anyone should inherently um, be unable to participate, right? We want the process to be accessible. And so we can do that by translating materials, using simple language, um, building money into our implementation budget um, for hiring translators, right? Um, and those kind of things. Another way that we can center lived experience is um, when we invite volunteers to come serve on the budget delegate committee, that work takes a lot of hours and it's research, you know, and it's it, it, it relies on folks knowing their communities. And so we can value and honor their lived experience by compensating people for their time, by providing public transit cards to make this more accessible for folks to actually show up every single week. Um, other ways that we can um, have successful participatory budgeting are by doing field research to inform the goals of our processes, like what's actually needed in the communities, what should we set money aside for. 
Um, and then finally, we commit to learn by doing and taking an experimental and experiential approach, right? And so we do this because we, we, need, we accept that doing something new, there will be challenges, there will be tensions, especially during a pilot process, right? And so we don't usually do democracy and participation in this way. So having the spirit of experimentation, knowing that um, we're learning so that we can do better next time is uh, the right approach to have for us to, to have a successful process. Yeah, I love that. And I love how inclusive it is. And these are good skills for people to learn. I mean, you know, like the field research and stuff. Those are Absolutely. Those are skills to, to learn um, and learn by doing. Love it. Now, I want to clarify some things because I've heard people ask, like, where do they apply for funds to try out PB? So is there funding for participatory budgeting? Like, what funds are we talking about? Yeah, great question. So what we like to say here at PBP is that if you can spend it, you can do PB with it. Um, we acknowledge that every budget is different and PB might not work the same for every budget, um, but PB is a versatile process and we allow this allows for communities to be creative and adaptive in how they um, take these budgets and um, use PB uh, use PB to to learn how to apply them right and so this works for um, public funds like local state and federal budgets um, it works for funds for with specific purposes like nonprofit um, funding right that sometimes is um, restricted. Um, but, you know, this can also be done with like discretionary funding from elected officials. Schools can do participatory budgeting with like many different parts of the budget. This can happen in like public schools um, up to all the way to universities. And we also see law enforcement budgets being used to do PB as well. Um, what I want to emphasize here when we talk about funding is that we don't need to look for new sources of funding to do participatory budgeting. We can take parts of existing budgets and share power and use collaborative decision making to um, to decide how we want to spend that money. Um, to provide a to make this like more real and provide some examples, um, you know, nonprofits can take part of their individual donations, which are unrestricted, and do a participatory budgeting process with their staff um, or their community. Um, schools can do this also with like maybe part of their infrastructure budget. Um, and so that, you know, you were already going to spend money. Um, why not allow the students to decide like what they need in this, you know, category of spending? And so um, the possibilities are, are really endless. I like that. So it, we should be thinking about this as more of an approach to yes. budgeting more than like a project. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's a way for us to get information from our communities and um, adapt to our individual contexts. So with that, where do we see PB happening across the United States? Yeah. So I want to start off um, by sharing a process that is um, going to happen in Denver, Colorado. And so um, they're still in the design phase. And so they're still kind of working on those things we talked about all the way in the beginning. Um, but I wanted to highlight this process because it shines a light on how we can use PB to address the structural determinants of health that Erica uh, mentioned at the top of our webinar. And so this process is being used to promote equity in substance use disorder treatment. Um, it's being funded by a tax um, that sets aside funding for addressing mental health and substance misuse in Denver. And so this is a great example of how we can see PB is that framework that supports us in addressing um, the issues that are important to us. So keep a lookout for this process happening in Denver in the next few months. Yeah, and I love, the, again, loving the fact that local people are getting a chance to weigh in on how um, this local decisions about funding and how it's going to um, impact them they know yeah. what what um, health issues are impacting their lives so and what's happening in Rhode Island so in Central Falls, Rhode Island, um, this um, the first process I want to share from Central Falls is called Voces con Poder. It's a process that happened a few years ago um, in the schools in Central Falls, where students and parents um, got to decide on how to spend $100,000 from the American Rescue Plan Act 
ARPA, also known as COVID relief funds, um, to improve their schools. And so they spent the summer um, meeting and planning on what they wanted to see in their schools. Um, this process was really successful. And um, the city of Central Falls with a neighboring city of Pawtucket um, had another PB process that was run by the Rhode Island Department of Health through their Health Equity Zones Initiative. And in this process, residents got the opportunity to decide on how to dedicate $385,000 to um, improve the conditions that help us stay or become healthy also known as like social and structural determinants of health, right? Um, and so the weeding projects in this process were a sprinkler and water um, outdoor fitness park and uh, mental health and the stigma a campaign. Um, and so we can see that folks identified this is what we need in our communities and um, they got, you know, to, to see that through. And how wonderful is it that the students mm -hmm. are working with the parents? in this de um, democratic process. I think that's so awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good, good experience for young folks. And then in LA. Yes, so the last process I wanna share about for now is the process happening in LA City right now. It's um, being called LA Repair. And, um, you know, before PB started in LA, um, Organizers were, um, you know, organizing for years, advocating for new approaches to public safety and for substantial investments in black and brown communities. And so um, when to recognize that this process, um, you know, happened because of this like deep community organizing. Eventually the Office of uh, Racial Equity is formed to administer the process. And um, it's being, um, the process is being held in nine repair zones um, within the city of LA. So it's not a citywide process. And the repair zones were selected on a number of factors. And you can see on the slide here, some of the factors, including employment and poverty data, home access to internet, um, really notably um, the COVID-19 case rates that we saw during the pandemic um, kind of so many trends with um, black and brown communities, low income communities having much higher case rates, right? Um, also like historically red line neighborhoods. And so the repair zones were selected based on a number of factors. And um, they're currently um, in their, uh, the second part of their uh they did a, a two year cohort. And so they're in the second year right now. And um, having a great process. And one of the things I wanted to highlight about the LA process is that, um, you know, L uh, effective PB requires both a commitment to racial equity and shared decision making from those in government and those in power, um, because, you know, it doesn't happen if people are not willing to share that power um, and invite community in. Um, but it also requires accountability systems that are rooted in a strong base of community members. Because um, we, again, we want to do PB well, not just do any kind of PB, right? And so um, really having this grounded in a strong base of um, community members and organizers who are fighting for um, for this investment into their communities. Absolutely. And so I know that with any strategy, there are challenges, <laughs> no, matter how, no matter how great it sounds. So like, what are some of the challenges that you have seen happen with this process and, you know, communities that are thinking about trying it out, just kind of give them a heads up, like, how can they manage those challenges? For sure, for sure. So one challenge that I wanted to highlight before PB even gets off the ground is us getting buy-in from elected officials or those in power, right? And so, um, you know, this can be hard because if elected officials spend their careers trying to get buy-in from their communities um, and trying to um, gain the trust of their communities um, to have their job of making decisions about the budget, right? And so this is an opportunity for us to say like, yes, that is your job and thank you. Um, and like PB has so many benefits. Um, like it's an opportunity for you to show your community that you trust them. Them, um, that they know um, what's right for them in a way that you may not have access to as an elected official. It's a way to take money that's already going to be spent and use it more precisely on what communities need. Um, and I think a great example of this is in New York City, um, in the first two years of their PB processes, air conditioners in schools were a really popular um, idea that went on the ballot and a winning idea. 
And eventually, you know, this is this is data also for the city council to say, wow, this is really important for people. And so eventually the city council passed like a, a multi-million dollar bill to implement air conditioning in all the schools. And so this is a way that we see that PB the process itself helps us to get information about what's needed in our communities. Um, the next one that I want to share about is time and resources. And so the reason this is a challenge is because doing PB is more time intensive and it just takes more resources to make de decisions collaboratively than the way that we normally do it with just a few people in a room making decisions, right? And, um, you know, this also connects to outreach. It's it's hard to do outreach to so many people, particularly when we want to center those who are traditionally have not been centered. That prevents a, presents a challenge with resources. You know, it takes a lot more to do those things. And some of the ways that we can address that, I think, are just, number one, let's expect things to take longer and plan ahead for that, right? And so we can do a lot of that in our in the planning phase of PB. Um, but one of the things we can do is, you know, set aside money in your implementation plan um, for targeted outreach to communities who will need more uh, of that outreach before becoming involved. Um, for the process to be effective, like we need those people to be in the room. And so that's one way that, you know, we can address that just by planning ahead, knowing it's going to happen. And I think one of the things that we can also keep in mind here is that PB is more than just like one cycle. It's about more than just running the participatory budgeting process. It's about creating long-term systemic change and how we and like our communities relate to democracy and how we do democracy. And so pilot cycles especially can be very hard and communities may feel discouraged. Um, but I think the important thing to keep in mind here is that, you know, again, like I mentioned earlier, we're learning um, so that we can do it better next time. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to bring up is um, managing the community's expectations. And so a question that I get very frequently is, you know, I love this idea. I want to do this, but I can't because everyone will want. And then you fill in the blank of what they think people will want. You know, for example, um, people in schools might say, oh, you know, the kids, they're all going to want pizza parties every week or, you know, a game room or something like that. Um, nothing wrong with those things, by the way. Um, but those are the things that the person saying the, the having the resistance is not going to want, right? And so I have um, two things to say to this. Number one is, you know, a little bit of pushback and let's like trust our communities to know what they need. Um, you know, one of the most common winning projects in schools is like not pizza parties. It's actually bathroom repairs. And this is because students need that in order to feel safe, in order to thrive during the school day. Um, but the folks making decisions on the school bathroom repair budget, you know, folks on the school board, teachers, administrators, they are not using the student bathrooms. And so, you know, students have this data that um, other folks are not exposed to. You know, and this is just one example out of so many and like that thousands of communities. The other thing I would say to this kind of thing of um, this pushback in managing communities' expectations is that we have a, a mechanism in the, in the PB cycle that allows us to plan for this. It's the design phase. So in the design phase, we, um, we name, okay, this funding has a limitation. This funding is only for programs and services. This funding is only for infrastructure projects, right? And we communicate that to the community very clearly. If we have a specific goal or focus, like addressing social determinants of health, we'll also name that. And so when somebody comes with the idea, you know, I have so many potholes on my street and so frustrating, we can respond to them like, yes, that is so frustrating. And like, let's do some advocacy. Let's fight together to get funding to fix those. But what we're doing here is something different and like re-inviting and re-inviting folks to, to participate in that, you know? Um, that's how we can address that. I appreciate that. I appreciate you um, lifting those up. Very quickly, I know that you all offer some um, support to groups that might want to try this out. Um, tell us about this very quickly, what, how you are able to support communities. Yeah, so at the Participatory Budgeting Project, um, we support communities in three main ways. And so we provide technical assistance to folks who are currently implementing their participatory budgeting projects in cities, schools, organizations, um, for folks who need that. We have a participation lab that does research and um, 
design, innovation, testing improvements to participatory democracy practice. And then we also have campaigns and advocacy support that supports folks in their advocacy space who are trying to fight for implementation of PB um, in their context. And um, that's the role that I play. Um, and yeah, those are some ways that the participatory budgeting project supports. And so um, if you are interested in, in any of that, or if you have questions, I know we'll have um, Q&A afterward, but my contact information is on this slide. Um, so feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to chat. Thank you so much, Anita. I appreciate you um, just opening this discussion or conversation rather about participatory budgeting and now I'm going to um, invite um, Benji back. Um, thank you so much, Benji, um, for, for joining us. Um, I want to start with health departments. Like, you work at a health department. <laughs> Why are health departments interested in PB? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Erica. And first, before I get going, just a shout out to Anita and Participatory Budgeting Project. They are the OGs of this work. And I feel like I'm standing on their shoulders um, talking about the projects we've done here in Pierce County. So highly recommend Participatory Budgeting uh, Project and their website to you all that I'm sure in the resources. I'm not going to read these slides to you as I go through them because I know you all can do that, but what I will say about why we're in this work is that centering community voice and moving at the speed of trust is central to our approach in all of the community outreach that we do throughout the department. And it's exactly the sort of best practice that I disseminate through the Public Health Centers for Excellence, which is our consultancy that in this work. PB really empowers people. Uh, and it strengthens communities. It shifts the power from institutions to the community members themselves and puts final decision-making in their hands. And that process of uh, empowering folks builds self-efficacy and it leads to increased civic engagement and social cohesion. And those things in turn show up in not only community benefits, but also in individual health benefits. So there's more information on uh, all of this research that led up to this in the journal article I wrote a couple of years ago, which is also in the resource guide. But there's a lot of science behind this stuff, and a lot of it is still emerging and evolving right now. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, there I, I can see how that would that sense of empowerment can actually influence our health for the better. So um yeah, thank you. Because whenever I was like health department is doing PB, what's the connection? So thank you for that. Now, you know, earlier um Anita was telling us about sometimes getting elected officials on board with this can be a challenge. How easy or 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 how hard has it been for you all to get elected officials in, you know, um, to think about PB as an approach to budgeting? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can see I'm leading here with like revolutionary queer black artist, sister outsider, Audre Lorde, right? So there is definitely a transformative sort of revolutionary heart of this work um, that's embedded in it. And for us, I find that the elected officials are actually the easy ones. It, regardless of which side of the aisle they're on, they have the direct contact with communities. They see the impacts of health benefits. Sometimes they don't know what the community needs. They just know that they want to support something in community. And so we've had really good luck getting officials, um, both from conservative places and very progressive places, to invest in this kind of project. Tacoma is itself, um, in Pierce County, a very purple place, right? So we have an urban tribe of Indians, Puyallup tribe of Indians. We have 23 little jurisdictions, the largest of which is the city of Tacoma. And so you would assume that all of the projects have really been centered in the urban core in Tacoma. And a lot of our biggest projects have been. And I know that Liesl and some of the folks from city of Tacoma are here, and I hope will participate in the conversation after the fact. But the reality is we've done these projects just about everywhere. And mayors, council members, and all of those folks have been super supportive in finding funds and helping us connect. Um, for me, the hardest part has actually been the middle managers, people like me, right? White guy with a little bit of power. They just want to really hold on to it. Uh, and I say that as somebody that had to learn through this process what actually giving up my bit of power to the community actually looks like, right? PB is a disruption of normal power dynamics and processes. And so our institutions 
that can be uncomfortable for subject matter experts in finance and human resources and legal and communications. Often um, we believe that there's one right way of doing things and that isn't necessarily the case, right? I truly believe that people know their own bodies, their own families, their own neighborhoods, their own communities best. And so finding that authentic sense of partnership through this work is really important. Uh, but it is a process to talk people through actually giving the final decision making to the people and not holding back on that power. Yeah, I, I appreciate you clarifying all of that. And, you know, you just talked about how you have you all have um, supported PB processes across the state, because some people may think that it's only in the urban areas or, oh, this is a progressive strategy or whatever. So can you share some of the examples of where you've seen PB happening across this purple county, as you described it? Yeah, absolutely. So you can sort of see in this slide, we started by doing it ourselves, and then we've transitioned to more of a partnership, training the trainers approach. And now we're sort of in the backseat, um, watching and supporting and evaluating for our partners in Pierce County primarily, although we still do some projects. So we started by leading a pilot project in a local park in Pierce County, you know, traditional crumbling tennis courts, the white uh, base that was there before playing tennis was no longer there. What do we do with this space? Is it a spray park? Is it a football um, you know, facility. And so that was our uh, boots on the ground kind of learning experience. We really learned through that process that we didn't have enough buy-in from the people in power uh, because when the community came back and said, here's what we want, the, there were a million reasons that couldn't happen. So we're like, okay, key learning there, right? So we're going to do it better next time. So the next project we did, which there's a case study uh, documented by University of Chicago on this work in the resource guide, we did uh, three urban school-based projects in East Tacoma, one each in an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school, and led different kinds of projects in each of those schools where the students decided what they wanted to see as an outcome uh, that would improve their health in their schools. And I was a little skeptical going into this that younger kids would be prepared to make these kinds of decisions. Like Anita mentioned, you know, pizza parties and whatever. I think I was sort of um, in that camp going into it, but the projects ended up being really transformational. Like in the high school in East Tacoma, a number of um, young black and brown men shared that the lack of mirrors in their bathrooms and sort of the basic dignity amenities made them feel like in their own words, they were already in prison. And so it's been very powerful to see this work. The subject specific rural projects like White River, which is super geographically isolated, um, has a lot of health discrepancies out in rural Pierce County. We did an amazing project out there uh, in White Center where uh, uh, housing for seniors who had some mobility issues, those folks in wheelchairs really wanted to get outside and connect to the earth again. And so through that project, they created raised uh, garden beds right outside the facility, which not only gave them their contact with the soil and literally that grounding, but also created a social network of folks who were interested in that work and could reinforce and check up on each other when they're out there growing their carrots. So then we sort of brought stuff to scale, right? So Tacoma Creates is a project where um, the city of Tacoma did a tax measure to support arts, culture, science, and heritage projects in neighborhoods in Tacoma. And we worked with a $100,000 pool in East and South Tacoma where citizens decided what they wanted to do with those dollars. And that was really the first bringing it to scale big project, very successful. You'll see more of the outcomes there. And during the pandemic, because all of us were working 24 seven on COVID primarily, we turned more toward evangelizing this work, you know, writing the journal article to create the evidence base and that kind of stuff. But we're starting to see the projects that we started here go to scale. Like uh, Liesl, who's here in the discussion group today, the city of Tacoma just led five $1 million projects in each of the five council districts in the city of Tacoma very, very successfully. And the next stage of the work for me is bringing it to a state level. So we're talking about a major cli climate justice initiative that'll be administered by the state of Washington as the first statewide PB project in Washington state.
Yeah, I'll be excited to hear about that first statewide project. Um, thanks for those heartfelt um, examples, you know, how the how the youth in, in the high school and the older adults wanting to, to connect um, back to the earth. What wonderful ways to use this approach and to gather their input. Um, and oh, by the way, I do want to mention a couple of times you've mentioned the resource guide. For those of you who don't know, we create a resource guide that goes with every webinar. It's a customized guide. And both Benji and Anita have put some resources into the guide that we're going to share with you all tomorrow. So you'll receive those in your email um, inboxes tomorrow. So thank you, um, Benji, for um, previewing what's what's in that resource guide. Let's talk about some of those awesome outcomes of PB. So what have you seen as the outcome of this work? Um, where PB has occurred. You bet. So you see the images here, right? So one of the things that communities have um, repeatedly told us through these processes is that celebrating diversity and really um, creating these large community events is super important. So in Tacoma now, we have Dia de los Muertos that's been brought to scale um, and gotten out of its kind of sustainability snafus of past years through this work. We've had um, Juneteenth celebrations on a community-wide level, which is fantastic. And of course, we're just still celebrating here Asian New Year. So the Lunar New Year celebrations as well. So lots of um, outcomes that are tied to the products that are the interventions that people want to see and they vote on and they get implemented, right? But just I want to draw to attention that like those are fantastic and those definitely speak to health, but it's the process itself which is tied to self-efficacy, which is tied to civic engagement, which is tied to those kinds of pieces. So I would say uh, that PB Project has done a better job of tracking uh, civic engagement and some of those large uh, outcomes on the national level. Their website is awesome. They actually did a research study that shows people that participated in PB projects actually vote more in future elections, and that that tends to increase over time. The older they get, the more involved they get over time. We just don't have the resources to do that kind of longitudinal tracking, uh, but we've seen fantastic outcomes on the local level as well. And um, what I would say about this is that where we have leaned in with uh, pushing ourselves beyond what's comfortable, right? To do the language access work, to reach deeply, for example, into our local Vietnamese community, we've seen fantastic results. To the extent that in uh, one of these PB processes that just happened in the city of Tacoma, we had more votes through our PB process than voted in that council district in the general election, right? Just let that sink in, right? We all know how much power and money gets pumped into elections, right? And despite that, because of the trusted messengers approach that we took with the community, because of the language access steps that we took, we saw more people. So it really speaks to getting beyond the usual suspects and creating the kind of community that we all want to live in. Yes, thank you for lifting that up. That process itself is where you're gonna see the benefits, the process when done well. and. Um, the fact that you had so many people engaged really does speak to the trust that's built when people know that they're being heard and that their their um, priorities are really being considered. So with that, I want to um, to ask you, like, if if participants are are just as excited about PB as I am, <laughs> mm -hmm. what steps would would you say they need to take? So this is the preparing funnel that'll get you to all the steps you need to do before you start that five-step process that Anita talked about, right? I would say, listen to Audre Lorde, define and empower, right? You cannot do this for everyone. The point of this process is once in relationship, always in relationship. And so you cannot make that same commitment to everyone. You want to take an equity informed, racially just approach to this work in your community and really define who it is that you will come back to, that you will commit to, that once the implementation of this project is done, you're still in relationship with, right? That's really, really key. 
um, understanding who you're trying to reach. Then identifying champions and funding. It could be an existing uh, pool of funding or budget, as Anita talked about. It could be we're trying to prove a concept, and so we're going to use this as an excuse to reach out to philanthropy. We've done both approaches very well. I would say on the identifying champions, it's not just the visible spokespeople, right? It is not just the elected officials who you're trying to seek. It's also those trusted people in the community who will carry weight and really drive the uh, work forward in those communities. And that's the harder work. So, you know, often you get these folks that come to our meetings that show up when we put a call out, but you know, they have the time and capacity to participate, which is great, but they often don't have a lot of weight and trust in the communities themselves. And so we go and sit in a neighborhood where we're going to do a project. We talk to people at the coffee shop and we say, if you had a problem and you needed to get some uh, immediate satisfaction on it, who would you go to in this community? And if you ask that question a number of times, you hear some names that may not be the names that you see on those sign-in sheets, right? And so that's how we've sort of broken through and identified champions. Then I talked about having hard conversations and there's a ton of them. And it isn't just at one point in the process, it's at every point in the process, right? All the way from design, all the way through implementation and evaluation. This is a... a process that requires a lot of talk to get people on board, to get people comfortable, to get people uh, uncomfortable uh, and willing to learn and grow, right? And so then I would just say train. Like the front front line staff really get this. They understand how exciting this is, but they need training. And it, not just at one point in the process, like you can train the folks who are going to lead the process, but then midway through, you've got you, partners identified who are going to implement who have no idea what you're talking about. So you've got to train again midway through the process. Um, so just be prepared for that level of work. It is uh, very intensive and super exciting. And I'm just humbled to be uh, part of its story here. Yeah, yeah. But the investment is great, but with the rewards are even greater, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and Benji, you all also support communities that are interested in PB. Here's Benji's um, information. Um, again, um, Benji, thank you so much. Some people may have may miss your email address. Don't forget you have all the slides, access to all the slides, so you can get um, information from both Benji and Anita. And right before we go into um, q and I just kind of want to summarize what I heard um, from both of you. Um, participatory budgeting is a democratic process and it has the potential to build community power when implemented successfully. And this process can create healthier communities because it builds trust like you heard Benji and Anita talking about it, creates opportunities for residents to engage in decisions that are gonna affect them directly. So it really does have that potential um, to, to build uh, power and know that PB can be implemented in different settings. It is an approach. It's not something that you have to do um, like, oh, I have to get grant dollars to this. It's an approach to budgeting dollars that you may already have in a, in a budget. So we encourage you to seek support if you're thinking about incorporating PB into your work because we realize that today's webinar is just an introduction to the strategy. It's not meant to, to be the all in all. And like Anita and Benji were both saying, training is important. So continue to learn more about PB by checking out our What Works for Health database of evidence-informed strategies, because you're going to find some implementation examples um, when you check out this strategy using that keyword, and also some questions to consider to maximize the strategy's potential to advance equity, which is what we all want. So be sure to, to check out What Works for Health. And with that, I'm going to pause. I know the Q&A box is full. So it is full. There. I was waiting to be able to launch into Q&A. So I want to welcome Anita and Benji back. Thanks, Erica. So I'm just going to try to get through as many of these questions as possible. So knowing Anita and Benji that we've got a lot more than we can address during our time, just going to ask you to keep that in mind in the responses. Um, so Anita, um, you know, I think a lot of our our attendees really um, keenly 
caught on to this potential tension, tension that can occur when uh, community members participate in this PB process and then the implementation, implementation stage and really acknowledging that, well, some communities may go through the process, but those ultimate decision makers may not ultimately do something, anything, right, with what the community has voiced. So how do you deal with um, getting pushback, number one, from citizens in this space um, when they're asked to volunteer, um, and then ultimately there are paid decision makers making the decisions? And how do you ensure that the priorities of the community members are actually heard and actually affect spending? That's a great question. Um, and I think it speaks to, um, you know, yeah, the tensions that, that come up when like we're trying a new way of doing democracy. I think to address this first part of the question around pushback from, you um, people who are asked to to volunteer and then you know whether implementation really does happen um i think that part of this the answer to this is like the accountability piece that comes from community involvement um and so like when pb starts um with community asking for it i think that follows through with like community um keeping electeds accountable um to what they committed to um pb also requires um an upfront commitment right from the electeds or whoever is putting this funding source forward that the projects that win will be funded it's not a consultation it's not a what do you think is a good idea and we'll take that into account when we go do the budget it's what you say goes um that's part of the design and we do that because what you described joanne is what happens unfortunately um you know benji alluded to this and i'm sure he can speak a little bit you know even more than i can right now about the harms done to um, low-income black and brown communities who have been promised um who we've right. like consulted and researched mm -hmm. um but we haven't you know followed through and so pb builds that in Thanks. Benji, do you want to maybe comment very briefly on how decision yeah, makers absolutely. in Tacoma Pierce are held accountable? I mean, we just had to fail forward, basically. I talked about the project that we piloted with, which I would consider a failed participatory budget project, right? And I feel like um, we make mistakes through this process constantly. So that's one of the things I just want to share with you is that like, you know, obviously I'm putting on the, the happy face today, but we continue to learn and we continue to do things wrong and we continue to identify where um, there are rubs with community through these processes. But I think that there's a gift in that, that bringing to light those discrepancies gives us a way to start addressing them structurally. And let's be honest, like the electeds are giving you 2% of their city budget, right? The funders are giving you $150,000 of their millions of dollars of spending. They're not giving up all their power. The institutional inequities between the institutions doing the work and the community are not addressed at a root level, but it's a process where we examine that and the powers and the conversations. Thank you, very good. Um perspective you put on that, Benji. Okay, here is kind of a more fundamental question. And is there an ideal range of the actual dollar amount of a budget for PB to work best? Can it be challenging, for example, if the amount to spend is too little or too large? For both of you to comment on. I'll start. Uh, we've done a lot of different sizes of pools because I was curious about this question starting out, right? So we did different pots of money in bunches of our early projects before we got larger pools committed from the city of Tacoma. And um, I found as long as the dollars are large enough to feel significant to the group that you're looking to participate, that is what matters, right? And that varies a lot depending on whether you're talking about elementary school kids or community members. I, I also think that one thing that we take for granted being in this work is knowing how much things cost. I think a lot of community members don't necessarily, right? And so if you say we're going to do $10,000 towards something, that sounds like a lot of money because it is a lot of money in their lives, but it doesn't go very far when you're doing a PB project to rehab a park, right? So I think that's part of this conversation is letting people know how many resources 
are required to make changes of substance and how much time is required to improve the health of families and communities over time. But we have found great participation regardless of whether the amount was you know, $3,000, $150,000, or a million dollars. We've done all of those, and it's we've had really good, consistent results across all of them. That's great. Helpful. Anita, you want to comment on that? The only thing I'll, I'll add, I agree with everything Benji said, is that um, I hesitate to say a specific dollar amount because I don't want folks who don't have access to so much money to say, oh, we can't do good PB without it. Yes, you can. Um, but I also don't want to um, say, let's choose the minimum amount of money that's meaningful and do that, right? Because it really is true that I think the more money we can put towards some of these projects, like the more impactful projects we can choose, particularly when we're uh, talking on the municipal level um, with like hundreds of thousands of people, um, those kind of things, yeah. Yeah, and so what you're reinforcing, Anita, is this idea that it just becomes a baked-in practice of any, regardless, you know, of any decision, right? Because sometimes the it might not be how to allocate dollars, but it may, may be how to allocate resources, non-financial resources, and the community should be part of that. All right, we had a couple of questions about evaluation that we didn't have a, a lot of time to spend on doing your presentations, but enough folks wanted to know a little bit more about successful types of evaluations and measures for the PB process, things that you've used, um, you know, how, how can this affect sustainability planning? And then a sub question is, how, what kind of measurements can you use to let you know when you have enough and the right voices? involved in a PD process. So maybe we'll start with you, Anita. Yeah, I will say that we have a resource on our website that um, covers this, um, just how to do municipal PB evaluation. Um, I think as like an overarching kind of thing, we can look at things like, um, did the people that we wanted to participate, participate, right? Like when we look at demographics in our city, um, of who doesn't typically participate or who is um, in those like hard to reach areas, like were they in the room? Did they vote? Um, those are some of the things we want to look at to tweak, but I'll let Benji speak to some of the ways that y'all have done it in your process. Sorry, having trouble unmuting there. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, public health, we love our evaluations, right? So we do an, a lot of qualitative evaluation and quantitative evaluation when it comes to these things. Frankly, um, some of the quantitative results around number of votes and so forth has, has really blown me away. Um, it's been super exciting. But in terms of telling the story of PB, those stories and the qualitative pieces have really been helpful. Right. Um, there are decision makers who want to know it works. So you got the quantitative uh, stuff that you gather. But having those stories and um, examples has really changed hearts and minds in Pierce County. So you kind of have to do both. What I will say is that, um, you know, the we've done several recent evaluations of the PB process through Tacoma Creates. We're working on a follow-up to specifically look at the language access pieces that we did to get beyond the usual suspects into communities that don't have English as their primary language. I'm happy to share those with uh, folks who are in, in the room because we want you to learn from our mistakes as well as what we've done right, right? Um, and so I'm happy to just share those uh, out with you if you follow up with me from the link online. Very gracious of you. And I am so disappointed because there are tons more questions, but just didn't have enough time. Erica's back on screen to transition us out from the webinar. But those of you who still have uh, questions out there, please, please join us for the discussion group. I know it's going to be a very rich discussion and we'll have more time with Benji and Anita. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that discussion group too. I'm going to ask Colleen to place that um, survey link in the um, chat for me. Um, please do link to the survey and let us know what you thought about um, the webinar because we do take your um, we take your feedback to heart and we try to make these webinars as meaningful as possible for you. So I want to ask you a question. Are you ready for the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps annual data release? I know I am. We're all working really hard behind the scenes to get everything ready. 
And you can join us next month on March 12th so we can get you all prepared for the data release. We'll be sharing new ways to help you understand how long and how well people are living. We're going to show you sharper data tools, so navigation tools, and new what works for health strategies. And you're going to get to meet some of my colleagues that you may not have met before. Bethany Rogerson will be here to join us, Molly Burdine, and Jill Jillian Gigliarano. So we will all for an extended Q&A session that day. So Joanne, you won't get cut off so fast, but we will offer an extended Q&A session for this webinar. Please do make sure that you, um, that you register for it today. So um, we've been talking about that discussion group. Colleen's going to go ahead and put a link in the chat so you can join us in the discussion group. Again, always engaging. You get a chance to share um, with others about the work that you're doing and hear from others. So please join us in that. And of course, be sure to stay in touch with us through social media and by subscribing to our newsletter. I want to thank Anita Dos Santos and Benji Biddle for sharing their wisdom with us today. And thank you um, to you all for everything you do to advance equity in your communities. I hope to see you in the discussion group. And I look forward to seeing you next month on March 12th. Have a good afternoon.